You're listening to Shaziz Radio, where originality and original music never stop. Isn't that that mad scientist dude? Welcome to Shaziz Radio. Welcome to Shaziz Radio. Hello, this is Chrissy McMahon, and you're listening to Alchemical Connections on awakeradio.co.uk and shazizradio.com. And uh, tonight in Laporte, Pennsylvania, we have 33 degrees. It's Sunday, February 2nd, 2014. And coming up, uh, we will welcome Mark Dancy from the Philippines. He's a world-renowned evaluator of energy technology and is currently a partner in an energy research company. And we'll discuss his travels evaluating free and exotic energy claims. Um, we're going to come right back and uh, we're going to talk with our good friend as soon as I let everybody know that I have the stream. <laughs> I have the stream. And uh, thank you so much, uh, Live Mike, for your wonderful interview with Suzanne. And thank you, everybody, for listening. So uh, without further ado, I'll just say hello to my very special guest, Mark Dancy from the Philippines. Hello, Mark. Hi. How are you? It's, uh, thank you for asking me on. I always look forward to having discussions with people like yourself on these topics. Well, thank you so much for agreeing. Um, I'm, I'm so very grateful because uh, my new focus has been to be involved with alternative energy and I'm a big proponent of free energy which a lot of people don't understand and we're very fortunate that you're a critic <laughs> of free energy although you have presented something that is very akin to free energy although it was called ambient energy so you can explain that as well and uh, tonight uh, you wanted to speak about um, let me see if I have this right uh, your travels evaluating free energy and exotic energy claims the boom in re renewable energy and the influence of government policy and your work in developing environmentally friendly lighting and small power projects for the 1.6 billion people without electricity. Would that be all around the world or just in Africa? No, that's all around the world, uh, especially in Asia. There are a lot of people in Asia without, uh, and South America and Africa. You'd be surprised. Uh, I think about 1 billion of those people would be in Asia without uh, electricity. But that's, that's quite a lot of topics to cover. But uh, you mentioned I'm a critic. I think uh, I describe myself as a skeptic by default after many, many years of traveling the world, evaluating these technologies. Because uh, I've got interest in them. I've got an open mind. I want to be, I want one to work. <laughs> Believe me, I really want one to work. So do the people I'm associated with. But when you see constantly ones not working as claimed, you, especially when it's cost you a lot of money to get there or test it or do what you have to do, you're starting to become a little bit of a sceptic. Uh, I think it's a school of hard knocks, they call it, Chrissy. Yeah, a little bit. But, I mean, you have to be because today we want to give the most accurate information. I, I personally, since November, mid-November, have been doing... Uh, Fukushima update and I've been trying to sort out uh, the hype where the people are, are giving information that's absolutely fear-based and, and trying to scare everybody and trying to put that in perspective and give people the true information which is way scarier <laughs> for some of us than, than the things that they're trying to. We have a little bit of distortion. Do you know what that is? Uh, probably my bandwidth. Uh, I'll just make sure all the devices around the house are turned off. Just hang on for a minute. Okay. okay. Hey, can you ask everybody to disconnect from the network? Yeah. Sorry, I have my uh, daughters visiting me from Australia at the moment, and uh, and uh, the household. We have all our phones connected to one wireless network, so I'll get them all to turn it off because they're all probably doing this. Facebook and texting and all that at the moment. So. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. Um, communication. Yeah, I mentioned nuclear. I, I still am puzzled, like, I'm dead against nuclear uh, for many, many years. You know, you, you've seen what happens with Fukushima. It's, it, it's devastating, not just for us, but the next few hundred years for that, uh, for, for generations to come. 
but they've had the uh, an answer. I'm not saying it's the perfect answer, but thorium. And you would never get a meltdown like they had at Fukushima because thorium, using a, a nuclear energy generated through thorium, is it requires it to be, uh, it can't do an overrun, it can't melt down because it requires stimulus to do the reaction in the first place. You withdraw the stimulus and it just stops. And the half-life of the materials afterwards are uh, very short term, you know, measured in decades, not millions of years or hundreds of thousands of years. And it's interesting that they bypass this technology back in the 60s and 70s, but now there's a massive renewable, uh, uh, re renewed research into this. India's already built a plant. In Scandinavia, they've built some test plants. Uh, and then in China, they've got some 6,000 scientists and engineers and companies. One alone's got 750 staff just developing this technology. And I'm still on the fence. Is it safe? Is it not? But from what I've seen so far, it could possibly be a safe nuclear option. But I prefer to go down other paths. I mean, look at wind, look at solar. I know some people don't like wind. Look at solar. And what's happening, and you look at the policies, I'll clear out this policy thing. In the US, you've had massive failure where the government supported corporations to build solar panels or, you know, Solyndra and all these companies that went bust. They also finance and fund the big power companies. So the power companies get the wind power or they get the solar power and they send you a bill and... It's good for the environment, but it's still big brother, if you like, big corporations controlling the thing. You go to other countries like Germany, Australia, uh, Spain, many, many other Asian nations, and the government doesn't give the money to these big corporations. Sometimes they do, but they tend to give it to the people. So I'll give an example. In Australia, and where uh, many of your listeners might know Kultus lives, I have, I have in my home state, I have my niece. And what the government did in Australia, they paid the householder the subsidy to go and buy the solar panels to put on the roof. And it was a huge subsidy. It's been cut back now. And it was very, very generous. And as such, over 20, in five years, over 20% of the households, or one in five now in the state of South Australia, now have solar PV on their roof. And not only that, they own that energy. They can sell it to an electricity company. And my niece is very clever. She's put a whole lot of panels on. Gradually, they built their system up. She gets a check in the mail for the okay. excess power she's selling back to the grid. And she's very clever at organising. She says, "Why this? they're paying me more for the energy I'm selling than the energy I consume. So she does all the washing and all that at night now. So all the excess energy during the day goes to the power company and then she starts chewing it back. But by subsidising the individual and the, the cost of these solar panels have come down from $5 each, you know, just four years ago, five years ago per watt, down to a dollar a watt. It's just dropped in price. Manufacturing is dropping down to 30 cents a watt. So it's actually cheaper in a lot of countries now to put the solar on your new house or the solar into a system combined with wind, combined with wave energy or whatever than it is to actually connect to the grid now. So we've reached that point that solar and wind is actually cheaper in some, uh, in most circumstances in many countries than actually putting a coal-fired power station in. The net result of all this activity is the people now have the power. So when the government says, oh, golly, gee, all these people can generate their own electricity now, plus the wind farms are generating another 30%, when the government tries to do policy to support the coal-fired power stations or the nuclear power stations, the people say, no, you can't. We can pull the pin. And the government's listening. The government can no longer, or corporations in Australia and Germany, dictate to the people about energy. They're now saying, we own it, it's ours, and we can pull the pin on you. So uh, there's one little part in this equation missing, to get full independence, we need to have a way of storing this energy because solar, wind, and many of the other, uh, what are, I call them uh, green energies, we can't rely on them all the time, being consistent, except for wave and thermal energy. And you have a look at that, 
and there's a massive effort going in now to developing storage devices, both mechanical, electronic. The battery, the storage device that can be made cheap enough and reliable enough, that will then empower people that they can choose to be off the grid altogether or the local community might just have a microgrid. And the net result of all this, and this might surprise many of your listeners, is here's what's happened in the last year, in 2013. World banks and many financial organisations will now not finance coal mining activities or coal-fired power station projects. World banks, European banks, all that, but they are willing to finance solar, wind and renewable energy. Number two, many major, uh, in Australia for instance, they have now said there'll be no more coal-fired power stations built ever. And many major coal mining projects that were slated for the future to build coal mines have now been canned. China is now seriously looking at putting a cap on coal, on coal that's being consumed and coal-fired power stations and putting massive amounts, huge resources into solar, wind and other renewable energies. So in 2013, we saw a shift. We saw a major shift where in many countries, uh, many financial institutions now, you go to the New York Stock Exchange, all the hot stocks and the ones performing are renewable energies. All the ones that are falling over are the coal-fired power stations. In your state alone, I believe, they're shutting down eight coal-fired power stations in the next two years. So we've seen this shift in the last 12 months. What we need to do is to capitalise on that shift. And I better take a breath and let you ask some questions. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's funny because I'm, I'm thinking we haven't even introduced you really. <laughs> we just got right into the conversation. But as we continue, um, I was really fortunate. When I came to uh, the mountains where I'm living now in Pennsylvania, um, I had uh, this, he's actually my guitar teacher, John Trello, give me this book. It's called Energy, Overdevelopment and the Delusion of Endless Growth by the Post Carbon Institute and in the book, which is, is full of pictures, it's a beautiful coffee table book. It doesn't give the whole story, but it gives a better view than most people understand of the energy situation. On, uh, on page 12, it says net energy. It takes energy to produce energy. <laughs> What's available to society after the investment is net energy. Understanding that concept is fundamental to energy literacy. And the, the, the energy that provides uh, the most uh, bang for the buck is coal. Then next comes wind. Then comes conventional oil, the natural gas, uh, solar PV, nuclear, unconventional oil, and biofuels at, geez, I, I want to say 3% or, th or th 3 to 1 net energy ratio. So we go from 70 to 1 at coal to 3 to 1 at the yeah. biofuels. When was it published? What I year? think this was published in 2012. Hold on a second. I'll tell you yeah. in a second. But it's a beautiful book. It's absolutely yeah. gorgeous. And um, it, do it doesn't have a lot of information about the, um, the producers except for they are the post- Carbon Institute. There's absolutely no date on that. Um, that I could look in the book while you're talking, but um, well, I, the technology the technology is moving that quickly now, especially with solar. That the energy required to produce a solar panel, for instance, is being dramatically reduced. Uh, reduced. That's why the cost of it has come down so much. So the manufacturing processes are that efficient now that. Very little energy is expended in producing a solar panel, whereas once upon a time there was a fair argument saying more energy went into producing it than you ever need out of it. But that balance has changed. But the game changer to me, the big game changer for renewable energies is the storage technology. And I'll give you a final example of that. Look at the Tesla car. What a wonderful success story. They built this expensive luxury car and they're killing the market around the world. They're, they're absolutely selling zillions of them. The only thing that's keeping the masses from buying electric cars is this fear of, oh, what if I'm on the freeway and the battery goes flat, okay, and the limited range, like I can only go 100 miles. Well, 
the new battery technologies that are in the lab and the new capacitor technologies and the research that's already out there. And you've got to remember they're spending $100 billion a year on researching energy and uh, I think uh, battery technology is in the 20 to $30 billion a year. But it's already, the, the, the concepts are in the lab. In the next three to five years, you'll be able to go and buy your purchase your vehicle. You'll be able to drive at 500 miles without a recharge. You'll probably, in some states, be able to drive while you're driving along the road. It'll just be recharging as you're going along, picking up. Uh, uh, they, they can recharge it uh, using, uh, you know, put a line uh, in, the, in the road, a wire under the road, and it'll recharge your car as you're driving along in certain lanes. So they're going to be moving towards these these uh, systems because the battery technology will enable it. It will be that cheap, that efficient, that it will be cheaper to manufacture an electric car with a 500-mile range than it will be to do a conventional car. And that's when you're going to suddenly see, rather than 5% of the vehicles being sold being electric, it will be 95%. This is all coming. This is all reality now. And with that technology of recharging the car as you're driving, in Utah, already the university's got a bus and they put these coils at the bus stop under the road and when the bus is stopping to pick up passengers, it's recharging the bus. They're doing it in Korea on the electric bus routes. They're doing it in California. This is all great stuff. So this thing about not being able to drive that far in an electric car, you'll have unlimited range because you'll be able to charge a car on the fly and the battery technology will enable it. So all these things are just starting to crystallise now and I think 2013 was the year where it flipped, where the actual, everything's flipped over. Coal is out of fashion, oil's out of fashion and we've seen the beginnings, the seeds of, uh, you know, when I look at 20% of all households now have solar in South Australia, in Germany it's even higher. Uh, and I look at all these wonderful new electric cars that are starting to be sold. Everybody's saying this will never be successful. Well, Tesla's proved them wrong. It's hugely right. successful. So we're just seeing the start of this. But the other side of the coin is what do you do like in the third world countries and the work I'm doing with? 1.6 billion people spend up a third of their income buying kerosene to do lighting for their room. You know, they're dependent on the big oil companies, the big fuel companies. So what can we do to help shift that? So it's got to be a combined approach. So I'm really excited about what's happening. And we haven't even got on to free energy, but I just wanted to cover this alternative energy that just look outside of the US, for instance. Just look outside and see where are the success for it. What are they doing in Japan because of Fukushima, for instance? They're building a wind farm floating off the coast right now of Fukushima that's going to provide more power than the nuclear generator ever did. And tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of households in Japan now have said, up you to the nuclear. They don't want nuclear power powering the houses. So they're putting in solar and they're putting in co-generators like gas that converts electricity, uh, it converts into electricity and heat. So the population is speaking loudly over there and they're responding two ways. They're taking individual action as a protest and they're also the corporations and government are taking action saying, okay, we know nuclear is dead now. We can never do that again. And they're putting a wind farm in that's going to have more capacity than the original power station. So there are some good things coming out of that. Absolutely. And, um, and to go back to nuclear, um, I, know, I understand that Germany is uh, shutting down all their nuclear power plants, as Japan has had to do as a result of Fukushima. So it's just evident that people whether people or governments are moving away from nuclear energy. But here in the United States, they're talking more about the safe or smaller nuclear-powered plants, which just is scary to me. It doesn't sound like it's really an alternative. It's, it's really Not that it's not viable, it won't work, they don't have the money to, to implement it, but what's the safety factor? And as you said, uh, the Thor... I'm not going to say the word right. Thorium. 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 Uh, it, it, it takes decades instead of hundreds of thousands of years to dissipate. But still, I mean, do we still want that risk? We, when on the net energy ratio, solar provides almost 40 to 1 in net energy yep. 
to uh, as compared to nuclear, which is down around eighteen to one. Net ratio. Nuclear is, ex nuclear is expensive, and I'm with you. I'm not convinced yet, but it's a, a lot better than what we've got now. But I believe that if you put the resources they want to spend on nuclear and conventional power, I'll give you another little example. And this story goes a few years ago. It's about policy, okay? So this is uh, a little county, okay, or a shire or a council area, and they realise they need to build another power plant to meet the increasing needs of electricity. Now, if you ever go to Australia, you'll see on nearly every household, I don't know what the percentage is, but let's say two-thirds, there is a solar hot water system. And heating up hot water is a very expensive, uh, you know, heating up water uses a lot of energy. So in Australia, it's just something, and in Spain and a lot of other countries, they've done this forever. So this county, in, and it was in the USA, uh, it's sort of this is a, a good story and a bad story. They actually went ahead and they said, well, rather than putting a new power plant in, why don't we get everybody or subsidise everybody to put solar hot water in? And the amount of electricity that will be generated or saved through using thermal energy from the sun will be more than enough to not have to warrant building a new power plant. So the increase in demand naturally will be taken up by the savings, if that makes sense. So Absolutely. The amount, and the only problem is... Uh, when they did this, they didn't have the maintenance program. <laughs> you need to make sure these things are maintained and you've got a redundancy after 10 years. But think about that. If you, you, the people say, we need to build a new power plant, why don't you say, well, for the same money, we can give everybody free uh, solar hot water. What would you do? It's, it just doesn't make sense to build the power plant. It makes sense to say, all right, rather than spend $100 million on these power plants, Let's go and give, uh, uh, you know, a million people free solar, uh, not, not a million, say 100,000 right. people, free solar water systems, and that's going to reduce the demand on our energy dramatically, and that will accommodate for the growth we need. Well, why not do that? That just makes sense to me. And the countries yes. that are succeeding are doing things like that. They're being innovative. In fact, the biggest problem we got now, and people say, oh, solar subsidised, wind subsidised. Well, using Australia as a model, the grid suppliers now are in that much trouble because there's so much solar there. They can't maintain, a, they're losing market share. They can't afford to maintain the poles and the wires and everything connecting to your house. So the government now is having to subsidise the traditional power companies and the grid companies. In the meantime... We, as soon as this energy storage this transition figure is happening, we won't need that grid system. In five or ten years, it will be redundant. So you'll just have community grids, locally owned, local government, small or individual owned power sources. So the shift's already happening. The financial incentives, the business models, all getting turned upside down. But it takes a critical mass. So the big point I want to push today is everybody has to get involved. Now, the countries where you don't need the majority, but a large portion of the population participates in solar, wind, or alternative energy activities, they suddenly are very powerful politically. They're also very powerful as a consumer group, and they can start dictating terms. And that's what we're seeing around the world now. The last election in Germany, any politician who said, oh, we've got to stop this green stuff happening, not one person actually got up into power. And then you see the UK, their energy minister. Now, remember the UK have got equivalent to the Republicans in power. They've got the Conservative government. And their energy minister says, let's start an energy revolution. Let's bring, let's get rid of the big six power companies. Let's have 60,000 power companies. We want the individual, the people, small companies, firms, uh, shires, if you like, to be the new providers of energy in the UK. Let's turn the model upside down. And you know why he's doing that? That's a good, smart political position to take because he's seen what's happened in Germany, he's seen what's happened in so many other countries, that once you gain certain momentum, that's the only way to go. So you've got equivalent to Ronald Reagan in, you know, in government in the UK at the moment, and their, his energy minister, if you like, saying, 
let's get rid of the corporate power base using energy. Let's turn it over to the people. Let's have a people powers revolution. And he's bringing in the policies to support that. He's not talking about it. They're actually doing it. That's what you need in the US. For some reason, the US is, they got the model completely upside down. You've got the political model upside down. Everything's back to front. And until you flip the model to where you empower the people and bring the energy revolution to the people, you're just going to be saying, you're going to fall behind the rest of the world, quite frankly. You're just going to be, you're going to be the third world co country when it comes to energy in another decade. Well, it's funny you're saying that because everything that we know about the UK and the United States is that economically they are uh, pushing the country into third world status. So it, it it's kind of baffling to think that they're they're going to uh, provide the citizens, the communities, with the power, with the with the wherewithal to to harness their own power through solar or wind or you know whatever alternatives. When everything that they're doing in the at the government level, legislatively, however they do in the UK, is is to disempower. The people so it's how do we change that i mean without our just our voice it's got to be with the policy and how do you get that policy changed uh i'm not i'm i'm not a hundred percent sure how to go about it but it's happened in the uk i'm going what how did this happen i mean and the guy uh the, the guy is uh, i'm just trying to think of his name the energy minister over there but one of the policies I read that he just did uh, a couple of months ago is uh, is increased solar investment 800%, just at a flick of a, a wrist. But I just want to read you this statement, and this is very, very brief for what he says. This is from Greg Barker, the UK's Energy and Climate Change Minister, okay? Mm -hmm. I want to, and this is, this is very empowering words. Remember, this is coming from a conservative government and like you said, not unlike the US in many ways. I want to unleash a completely new model of competition and enterprise. I want to encourage a vast new army of disruptive new energy players to challenge the big six. From individual consumers to community groups to entrepreneurs uh, to SMEs and FTSC giants, I want them all to consider generating their own energy at real scale, as well, as well as being able to start to sell their excess energy on a commercial basis. A decentralised power to the people energy revolution. Not just a few exemplars, but tens of thousands of them. The big six needs to become 60,000. Would you ever right. expect that from a UK Conservative government? No. That's what's happened. And that's what they're doing. And they're following up with actions. Then I'm reading the World Bank, like the European Investment Bank, not the World Bank. They're saying, we're not going to back coal anymore. You want to build a coal mine or a coal-fired power station? Nick off. If you want to put a wind farm up or you want to build a solar farm or you want to do this or that, yes, we'll fund you. What a big shift. That's massive. It's like, oh, okay. So what I say to all these green energy agitators and all these people say, we've got to change the system, we've got to participate okay i ask a lot of my american friends you're always going on about the free energy and the every new revolution powering the people have you got solar on your roof you can go out today and get solar panels put on your roof for free okay it takes seven years to pay them off but they're paid off by the savings in the electricity and then after seven years you own it so no money down or very little money down there might be some permitting or town planning fees or something so you can now go, and Australia and many other countries have got the same model, you can go and get solar put on your roof tomorrow. No money down, in seven years you own your own power plant. So I say to people, don't talk about it, just go and do it. And when enough of you have done this, it's great. The other model that I'm pleased to announce in the US, there are these cooperatives happening. There are these community groups get together and they all go, the panels are, are very, very inexpensive, right? That you can get a whole solar system for under a dollar a watt, okay? Very cheap. What's a killer in the US? And I can't understand why. If you want a solar system and you use a contractor in the US, it costs you double of what it costs in Germany 
and Australia to get the same system. And it's the labour cost and the skill cost and the bureaucracy cost and the permitting cost and any other cost you can well imagine. Whereas what they've done, these community groups got together, uh, they formed a model out of California and they're duplicating this all over America where the local neighbours get together and, and they all help each other and they're doing this as a training ground for installers. So they're getting people who want to get their skills and experience and their certificates. So they pay some professionals to come in to train the young apprentices but the whole community helps and even if you can't climb up on a roof and bolt on a solar panel you might make the sandwiches or the cup of tea or you, you might handle that you might be accountant so you can handle all the paperwork and the tax or you might be a bureaucrat so they all come together with their skill sets and they go around and they put solar on each other's roofs so you might be part of a group of 20 people that have all combined your resources and you assist each other to get those panels on and it's cost you a little more than the physical cost of materials. So things like that are just brilliant and they're things that people can do. What I'm really sad about is the apathy. When people complain, 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 finger point, all the rest, but they don't do anything as an individual. It's up to the individual to participate. Sorry, I'll get off my soapbox now, Chrissy. No, no, it's a, that's what this is for. This is this forum is absolutely to, just to promote things that actually benefit individuals, communities, uh, people, rather than the corporations or the governments that support them. So, yeah, that's that's exactly what I try to promote in all areas that I discuss, whatever the topic is. <laughs> That's, that's my whole purpose for being on the radio. I have really no other, except besides I love doing it. <laughs> but no, that I, I so much appreciate it. And as I, I went through the list of uh, of topics that you uh, you wanted to talk to, uh, the boom in, in renewable energy and the influence of governmental policy is um, right there on the list. So maybe you could go on to talk about more about your work developing environmentally friendly lighting and small power projects for the 1.6 billion people without electricity and explain who they are because it well, they're all well, over <laughs> well they're all over in africa and in india like in india for instance uh i think there's 80 million without electricity and lighting and here's some interesting statistics 1.6 billion people do not have electricity full stop so they need to use kerosene lighting or burn paraffin oil or some fossil fuel source. Here's the alarming statistics. In India alone, there's uh, 1.3 million burn victims. That doesn't mean they die, but there's injuries, accidents, sometimes deaths or their bamboo hut catches fire or whatever. Uh, injuries caused. The tuberculosis rate from inhaling the fumes from this uh, kerosene lighting is 10 times that than if you're using electrical lighting. And there's a whole lot of health reasons why not to use it. The worst thing is, in some countries, like in the area I was the other day, you know, people earn dollar a day, maybe $2 a day. But they've got to pay a dollar, uh, you know, to keep one kerosene light going for the fuel for a week. It chews up a huge amount of their income and they're reliant, and guess who's getting the money? The big oil, the fuel companies. Who's supplying right. the kerosene? Who's making the profit? What are the alternatives? Simple, there's some very great innovative little solar charges that have come out, and millions are being distributed as we speak. Uh, little devices, size of a packet of cigarettes, put it in the sun during the day, and you get three or four hours of light at night. And in some cases, they can afford to do bigger systems. And there's many, many NGOs distributing and working on those. But I want to go a little step further because I found out there's 600 million people who can't charge their cell phones. That sounds crazy. And I'm living in the Philippines at the moment and I'm looking at, the you know, these people got nothing. Like I'm in a remote uh, rural village and they're living in a bamboo hut on the coast, living a good lifestyle and very happy. They've got the cell phone. We're gathering them to take them to the mainland to charge. And uh, uh, it's really amazing. The ownership of cell phones here is, is an average of two cell phones per person, which still baffles me. Uh, but they still need to recharge them. Now, in Africa, they might have to 
travel for a day by foot or by bicycle or mule or whatever they use just to go and get their phone charged. And the people who charge them are charging them 10 times the price of electricity to get them charged. So I started looking for a technology that solar was good but doesn't always work well in the jungle uh, and when there's a rainstorm and it can be expensive. So I found some technology that was being used for special applications in the military and that and uh, we found that we can produce, uh, we have a consumable by just using salt water and a very clever technology that's very cheap to manufacture, we can produce uh, using uh, basically a metal rod as a battery, we can produce something just for a few dollars that can charge their phones and give them the lighting and only cost <clears throat> 10 cents in the dollar or 20 cents in the dollar of kerosene to run. So if they have a metal rod the size of two AA batteries, for instance, that might cost them the cost of two AA batteries, that'll give them enough energy for equivalent to 100 or 200 AA batteries. So they can light up their uh, huts for you know months, run a radio, charge their phones several times over. The phones will draw a lot more current than lighting, so they might have to replace it. But it'll give them that independence and it'll save them money, it'll save them a huge amount of money, and they won't be dependent on big oil anymore. And they'll have money to buy more food, to buy books, to spend it on education. So uh, we're hoping to implement this soon. And the spin-off from this is suddenly we can come up with products and we've developed them and hopefully they'll be in production this year, where as a consumer, and you go to your Wally Mart or whatever store, your Ace Hardware, you'll be able to go and buy a flashlight that rather than get 10 hours out of a set of batteries, You'll be able to leave it on the shelf for 25 years, just out of water, and uh, it will run for 200 hours, 300 hours, with a simple, you know, dollar or two dollar replacement. And so, just little technologies that exist today that do exist and being applied in other areas can be adopted. And this is what I'm encouraging scientists and engineers to do: not think out of the box, think what we've already got, and how can we reapply it to come up with solutions. And I'm pleased to say they're coming up with many, I saw one the other day, it was a gravity one, you know, it was like a rock and it pulls down on this little generator. and It works. And there's many other little hydro solutions. So that's where I'm working at the moment. But I've also learned a big lesson. Don't assume what these people want. I was with an indigenous community uh, on the weekend, helping with a feeding program and education and that. And I was sitting there saying to them, don't let us tell you what we, you, you think we think you need. You tell us what you really need, okay? Don't think for one minute. You've got to learn and communicate with these people. And it's no good thrusting technologies on them if they don't know how to use them. It, it's no good thrusting something in, uh, they don't know about. You've got to understand what their needs are and how to communicate the solutions to them. And that's the other point of this. You know, we shouldn't be going around saying, hey, we know how to improve your life. We've got to listen to them and what they need first, then provide the solutions, then look at what do we already have out there that we can adopt to this solution. So that's the process I'm working on now. And not just myself, but many hundreds of organisations, scientists, universities and NGOs, all working on their pet projects to do this sort of technology. I've got a friend in America, he's developing one that uh, you, you put on the fireplace, a little disc if you like, and that will charge their phone and provide the lighting for them because they've still got fossil fuel, you know, for whatever reason to cook their meals with. Well, how can we harness that and put it to some good use as a stepping stone? So it's very, very simple. It's just not looking outside the box, applying existing technologies to these solutions. That's all it is, Chrissy. Yeah, and it's amazing. Um, I know you're friends with Cultus Negrand, and, and uh, he and uh, Shaziz, and we have Muddy Muddy Mudman, and we have <laughs> Kent Anderson. I'm I'm not sure. And there's, there's a couple other guys that I don't. Tom and an, and another uh, individual who um, come together and they're working on virtual labs. So oh they're, yes, yes, that's a brilliant program. Um, yeah. Sorry, I cut you off. So go ahead. You want, do you want to explain it? Because I, I, I'm not familiar with it. I just am familiar with their well, enthusiasm. 
Well, they had a lot of enthusiasm and talking, and then they got me on the program one day. I said, why don't you do something about it? And, oh, okay. <laughs> Absolutely. So engaged a couple of my friends. In fact, the guy who owns Revolution Green is a brilliant uh, program. Well, when I say brilliant, he's learned by hard knocks of putting up websites. And we said, what do we really need? And there's a lot of these wonderful backyard inventors and other scientists and all that. And we really needed a place that could do three things. First thing was if somebody had a new free energy claim, I tell you what, it costs a lot of money to fly to a country. I flew to Africa from the US. It's a 16-hour flight evaluated to energy claim. You take a scientist, the excess luggage and instruments and that. And you can go through 10 grand just like that. And you get there and, uh, oh, sorry, we decided to change our minds or it doesn't work, you know, it burns. So we thought, why don't we have a, a, a virtual lab that can do three things? One, somebody can present their technology in the lab and we can have a panel of physicists, electricians, scientists, whatever's needed, whatever technology is, to help assess it. And quite often when these people think they've got something, it's not a scan, it's not deceit, they just don't know how to read the instruments or they don't realise what's really going on and it's just fooled them for whatever reason. Not saying they're stupid, there's some very sophisticated things that the engineers and scientists understand and they're not seeing it because they haven't got the right instrumentation. And you put the right instrumentation on and you get the real picture. So to help these people assess their own technology without having to go to great expense as a stage one. The second thing you want to do is educate people. So have a virtual lab and a virtual lab means we've got video interactive voice a bit like a group skype call and they can educate there'll be people who present youtube if you like videos how do you test this technology how do you build this how whatever resources they need or information they need to help them with their project we can build up a huge reference library of uh, uh, let's say skills, information and knowledge they need to proceed. We can also build up a big database of past projects we've evaluated and I can tell you now, I, I wear it with a badge of pride that 95% of the things I attempt fail. You know, you get in the lab, hey, I got this great idea last night in the middle of the night, get in there, oh, that didn't work, but you learn from it and share that information so rather than people all repeating the same mistake, they can look up this library and say, ah, that's what I was going to do. Oh, that doesn't work. Oh, this one gives me an idea and to inspire people. And the third component of this is actually having an interactive. So the more advanced experimenters, we can bring in the scientists and engineers and we can sit there and have a round table discussion about, you know, how do we reduce the friction on this gear or, how do we improve the efficiency of this lighting system and bring in a panel of people so we've got this global room or this chat room or video room where professionals can come in and actually, you know, do whatever is required to help people advance their projects. So Kultus could have an invention, I could have one or anybody could have one. We put it there and say, look, we're at this point, we're stuck. Where do I need to go forward or should I be just throwing this in the rubbish bin. You know, that's what we're trying to do virtual labs. And there's never been really an attempt to do this. And what we hope to do is grow the community. Because personally, uh, I have dozens, if not hundreds of emails some months from inventors just wanting advice. Just how do we go about a patent? Uh, how do we measure this? Uh, can, and they, they don't want to be... Uh, in the public sphere. They don't want to have all these nasty, greedy entrepreneurs and companies chasing them down and causing all sorts of problems. They just want to develop their project and they just want to advise how to proceed or who they should contact or what skill set they need. So that's what the Virtual Labs is and they've constructed the site now. It still needs a bit of development but when we fire it up, I hope that it will draw the international community of inventors, scientists, retired people who can contribute their time and uh, build up this big resource of information to help gather speed, to gather momentum and share information and all bring about what we want. That is environmentally friendly energy that can bring independence to people.
Absolutely, and um, and I actually tried to have an alternative energy seminar at, in December, the early part of December, but um, my internet <laughs> was not reliable, <laughs> so it did not come off. But um, I had actually a cultist, my friend John Trello. I had Fernando Vosa. Well, he was my uh, keynote speaker because uh, his his understanding of of alternative energies. He takes it to another dimension. And his um, his thought is that as we develop these technologies, that we need to keep in mind the health not only of the environment, but also of the individual. So then we have John Searle, and uh, we have uh, Tesla. Uh, we have, um, gosh, I'm so terrible with names, but uh, Royal Rife. We have all these uh, individuals who are really persecuted marginalized, destroyed uh, for their work in alternative energies that created uh, energy producing objects that actually healed the body. And uh, in John Searle's case, um, he, he produced uh, the disc, the flying disc that not only flew and could produce the energy, but also it was a heal, had a healing factor. So we have all these people, and I, and I apologize because I'm um, I don't know all the names and I can't repeat them, but so many people and the knowledge has been so suppressed and so marginalized. Well, well, it's not, no, no, it's not suppressed. Uh, this is another area. What is mythology and what is real? You know, you're going to read Tesla's life and uh, there's a couple of really good books out there. Uh, he's his own worst enemy. He could, have, he could have died a multi-billionaire, but he refused to let his own people commercialize a lot of his technology because he always thought he was working on the next best thing. And a lot of his so-called perceived enemies supported him until he died. He paid his hotel bill and did a lot of other things. And he never begrudged Westinghouse or any of those companies. He was the one who tore up the contract, not them. They just said, hey, we can't sustain this deal we've done with it. Can we be more reasonable? And he says, oh, no, you, you've already given me a million dollars. Tore it up. But a lot of these things are mentioned, so, okay, they claim he did this and that, but why hasn't anybody been able to reproduce it, even with him as an advisor? I know of an effort in Thailand of $5 million was spent on cell technology, and $5 million in Thailand is like $20 million or more in the USA, and I know a lot of other big efforts. So part of my job, as much as I hate it, is to research and find out which claims in the past are pure mythology and which ones have some substance. And what I often find is, it's a bit like Chinese whispers, over the decades, people twist the stories and add their own agendas and use the information to support their own agendas, and it gradually the information becomes more and more and more distorted. So you've got to break it down, what really happened there, what actually happened. And sometimes I go to extraordinary lengths of interviewing people, witnesses, and all the rest of what really happened? What could have been happening? Is this something you've missed? And they've come back, and you have to get to the truth of the matter. And the reason I say this, the only way forward is to establish what is real, what is the truth, and you can build on truth. You can't build on uh, false premises. You end up with a house of cards if you've got no foundation. So part of the intriguing part of and it's more my hobby, is to look at what's claimed, then really dig deep. Because there are a lot of promoters there trying to promote their own causes or financially ca cashing in or their own claims and a lot of loose words. And you can go to a conference, and I've seen people 20, 30 years going to conferences giving the same old theoretical speech. And I, I'm one of these people, a lot of people hate me for it, I say, show me the data. Show me the data. That's a catch cry. I had an argument with a Pakistani overnight on Facebook he said, challenging all the engineers in the world to debunk his new invention. I said, well, don't show us the video. I'll fly over with my own team. Oh, no, we can't do that. They said, you're going to open source it. I said, we've got to test it or show us the data, show us your test so it can be peer reviewed. And then suddenly we find out, oh, the generator can't run without magnetic motor and vice versa. Con job straight away. So part of this that's very important to do is stop believing in all the methodology and sort out which methodology has got something worthwhile. And Tesla certainly has a lot of theories and technology that needs to be explored further. 
and sort out the other ones and ask the questions of Searle fans and John Searle. Okay, right. Why can't we reproduce this? We've got 10 times the technology now, building systems, 3D printers, of everything. Why can't we reproduce this? And if it can't be reproduced, then it's bullshit. It's as simple as that. And I have this argument worldwide. I went to the BN conference and they asked me there, I said, you surely want me there? I'm considered the world's number one sceptic of this stuff. And they said, well, you're the only one that can show us something that works. And I said, oh, okay. And I got there. And I've got many great friends there. Moray King, he's got some great theories and some should be researched and experimented. But I'm listening to person after person after person regurgitating the same old sensational mythology for 20 or 30 years. And I actually asked him a question. What if we actually found something at work? What happens to you guys? You haven't got an industry anymore. Okay? Go back, find out the facts. Find out what the truth is of those involved. Find out why it can't be reproduced. Were they suppressed or is suppression a term that somebody else is using it to, to cover up something? So to me, the truth is paramount. And most people can't handle the truth, full stop. They can't handle the truth. Well, we, um, know in the, we know in the 80s in the United States that General Motors took 300,000 electric cars and put them through the car smasher. We know that they, yeah, we know that they suppressed the the prolific pro, prolification of electric cars uh, in favor of the big gas companies. I I imagine, but there's and that was in the eighties. Look at today, yeah. Tesla is the hottest stock on the market. It's a twenty five billion dollar company. It's already worth half the value of General Motors. Guess but what it, General Motors' reaction is. We're going electric. <laughs> We're putting a huge team together now. We're going to go electric. Okay? Yeah, but, it but we could happen. have had it in the 80s. They, 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 and invariably, when they told us that uh, we had to go green, that um, you know we're wasting energy, shut your light off, stop running your water when you brush your teeth, all this stuff, gas oh, mileage, agree. you know. I and agree. Then, then they went and flipped it, and, and they started making those uh, SUVs and uh, promoting with uh, Schwarzenegger the, um, what do you call it, those army trucks. Hum, 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 hum. Hummers, Hummers, yeah. yeah. I mean, like but, Insanity, but eight, what is that, six miles to the gallon? <laughs> yeah. yeah, but look what's happened now. That did happen in the 80s. Did technologies get suppressed in the past? Yes. But what we have to do is work out, which ones were really suppressed and which ones are just mythology, okay? To, to me, something is real if it can be reproduced and third-party independently tested. Now, some okay. people live their lives based on myths, okay? Some scam artists, uh, and a lot in the free energy field, there have been a lot now going to jail who have ripped off the little mums and dad investors, the people who want to make change, based on using dropping name dropping of all these honorable people like Tesla and there's a whole lot of these people cashing in. There's so many snake oils men in the field. I mean Sterling, we're going to look at his site. You know, Sterling's very enthusiastic and he brings to attention hundreds of different devices. Show me one that works. Right. And most of them, most of them that I encourage these people to keep building the magnetic mains, to keep developing these devices. We all learn from them. And most of them are enthusiastic. Most that don't work is through measurement error or something they didn't understand. But there is a significant percentage out there. It's just a way for people to scam money, okay? And these people normally, I can't speak about them publicly because the first thing they put me under is a non-disclosure agreement. So come and test my thing, but if it doesn't work, you can't tell anybody. So I'm working under those conditions normally. But you build a skill set after a while that when you see so many devices fail and you work out pretty quickly, is this person just making a mistake? And if they are, we'll help them. And then they're grateful for that knowledge. They'll go, oh, good. Well, thanks for that. We can move forward. Well, the other ones... They want to get you know. I've had to move hotels in the middle of the night because gunmen are after me. Uh, I, I can't tell you the funny stories I've had happen to me in different countries. And I now I've got these Pakistanis uh, saying, "Oh, they'll look after the security arrangements for me." Yeah, that means a bullet to the head if I don't do what I'm told. So 
you know, this isn't an easy enterprise to be in. So all I say to people is ask questions. Do not take things at face value, okay? If there is a claim made, look for the evidence. Look, ask questions. Don't be square to question. As soon as they try and excommunicate you for asking questions, then you're reaching a cult status, okay? As soon as they start acting like a cult, excommunicating those who don't toe the line or ask questions or want to do further research or testing, run like hell. The ones who are genuine encourage, not criticism, but say encourage the questions, encourage investigation, encourage measurements to benefit and grow the knowledge base. Those who want to suppress it. So here's the irony. You mentioned the word suppression. The real suppression is coming from the free energy promoters and also is coming from a lot of the people making the claims. They're the ones suppressing people. They're editing their comments. They're banning people. I just read a whole string of emails on the weekend where a world-famous scientist, there's somebody saying to a person who's got a technology, don't let him in the door or don't let these people come and don't let these engineers come and don't like that. These people want to help the guy, okay? But they're saying don't do that because if they see it doesn't work, then it's going to be bad and I can't make any income from it. So the real suppression is coming from the community itself. Why should people ban commentary? I'm banned on that many sites. It's not funny. I probably deserve that because I'm rude. But I know a whole lot of other people who are very polite, very knowledgeable, very skilled, great scientists, great engineers. And as soon as they ask a question, they get banned or, or they get an, an attack campaign on them. So I really encourage people to look. I mean, some people want to believe so much, they won't accept any information. They're, they're lost cause. But if a technology is real or a past mythology, and I won't say mythology, a past thing is worthwhile investigating, and Tesla certainly, you know, go, he's got some great stuff, and we're only scratching the surface. But there's been a lot of that followed that are simply bunk. And people just cashing in and making livelihood based on letting people coming in and reading what they want into it. A bit like if you do a painting and put it on the wall, and if you sit back and listen to all the people who pass by and make comment, they'll all read something different into it, okay? And that's what often happens with these technologies. So when I hear suppression, the real suppression is coming from the free energy community itself. It's not coming from government. It did in the past. It's not coming from business. It's not coming from men in black. It's actually coming from the community itself. And too many people talk about the USA, USA, USA. There's another 200-odd countries in the world. And these technologies, as I said, in Thailand, in Asia, the amount of research and developments going on in these exotic technologies is phenomenal. But you never hear about them in the US. Why? That's a question your, your listeners have got to ask. Why aren't we hearing about them in the U.S.? Well, not on mainstream news anyway. I mean, this is not being promoted at all. So the the Breakthrough Energy Movement conferences have been the the fulcrum for people to get together to to realize, uh, much like we did after 9-11, so many of us felt isolated because we didn't know there were so many people out there that actually thought, the same way we did because we were told if you're not with us, you're with the terrorists. So, you know, a lot of people got shut down. So with that in mind, so now we have the Breakthrough Energy Movement conferences. People are coming together. We realize that it is global. And then now I'm being told it's possible that there's more people in the United States are actually working on these technologies. Oh, there are. There are. 95% of what's happening you don't know about. People right. don't want public attention. There are millions of dollars being spent on projects right now. I know of three major developments in the US. Nobody knows about them. They're, they're buried. <laughs> they're, but they're moving ahead. Uh, they're moving ahead and quite often with government support. And not, you know, some of these involve millions of millions. I know of labs are developing with millions of dollars of support. They're developing um, PAP technology, you know, but nobody knows about them. You get to hear about two or three people, okay? You get to hear about the John Rohners and all that. You don't get to hear about these other ones. And I can assure everybody 
there is some major projects happening around the world where these technologies are being prodded and explored. You know, when, when I see the HHO things, there's universities been testing HHO. The papers are out there. Go and search for them. So there is a lot happening. And if you like, it's not really under... But Russia is a great source. There's some so many wonderful technologies being developed in Russia. And they are, are happening. So is it actually quite vibrant? It's just not public. And the reason it's not public... Sometimes it's to protect commercial interests. Sometimes it's just to keep leave people in peace. Sometimes, and this is probably the most common, the people involved don't want to have their reputations tarnished in their normal life or the university they work for for poking around in this stuff. But gradually that's changing. You know, look at the research into battery technology now and other exotic technologies. So to me, I'm the optimist at this stage. This mass revolution of renewables is happening and it's gaining momentum in so many countries that the US is going to have to follow and toe the line eventually. There is this energy research, but it is scientifically based. All the programs I told you about that are underground are scientifically based. They're not based on mythology, they're based on science. And the only way forward, in my humble opinion, is you've got to deal with data, you've got to deal with facts, you've got to do with stuff that didn't happen 40 years ago, it's stuff we can do now. It could be based on something that happened 40 years ago, but you have to do the science to be able to reproduce it and make it available to everybody. So that's why I piss a lot of people off, Chrissy. I'm no, very it's, it's, uh, staunch. That's, that's, that's what we have to do. We have to use a scientific method. We can't just uh, make a claim and expect that people are going to just, because it sounds good, they're going to agree with us, or, or because we have certain facts, but not all the facts. Uh, we have some of the names, but not all the names. We have to be accurate. We have to be succinct, you know, clear, and make sure that what we're saying is based in fact, and it's valid, and it and actually has a purpose. Like, is it useful? Is it beneficial? Um, like, when I talk about nuclear energy, um, I just recently found out as a result of working on uh, Fukushima updates that uh, solar uh, fusion <laughs> produces more energy than nuclear fission. So yeah. <laughs> why aren't we using a fusion process that, instead of the fission process, which is well, dangerous and harmful and... <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, it's mind baffling, and 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 you can explain that. I also would love for you to explain renewables because I, I'm I don't think I'm clear on uh, free energy as a as a renewable. So maybe you could could clarify that for me as well. Well, he, here's one of the interesting things that, and this is all through discovery of my travels and that, and I, I get to meet some. Brilliant people. I'm pretty. I'm not that smart, really. I get to meet some brilliant researchers, engineers, and they're very patient with me. They explain complex series in layman's terms to me. But basically, what I discovered is the you've always got to look at the energy cycle. So if I'm ever looking at a claim, no matter what it is, what's the energy cycle? Where's the energy coming from? And, and what are we doing? How are we converting it to something else? To something useful? And you've always got to explain the source of energy. And that's very easy when you do solar or wind. You know, there's a wind, it's a harnessing nature. But when you start getting down what they call zero point or free energy, uh, you know, or is the universe consist of 50% of this, this energy source, it does. But it's not very dense. It's so the energy from the vacuum. They recently, one of the, and talking about universities, there's a university recently in America spent tens of millions of dollars building this huge bunker with a detector, like the, the detector must have cost 70 million or something, to try and capture and measure a little piece of zero point energy over several months. Okay? And <laughs> So when they talk about, oh, the research isn't happening, this is a massive project, high risk, to see if they could see one little piece of evidence of zero-point energy. And this is the problem I have when people say zero-point energy, energy from the vacuum, it exists, but it's not very dense. 
Now, we're talking about harvesting ambient energy, okay? You wanted that explained. If I got solar, you know, it's heat from the sun, plus the photons from the sunlight gets converted into electricity or heat into a thermal source. With the wind, it's the wind is harnessed in mechanical energy, okay? Thermal electric is harvesting a heat source into electric. And you can harness RF. RF is radio waves, you know, you can harness that and steal it. You can harness all these energies. So when they talk about uh, why we're having a problem of scaling up these small, what we call zero-point energy devices where we believe we are harnessing energy from the vacuum or harnessing zero-point energy and many other labels is why we can't make them really big and get large amounts of energy is the density is not there. So... In, in a room, the size of the room you're sitting there now, we may, there may only exist in that room a millionth of a watt of energy. But the universe is so big that 50% of the universe consists on it. But here on planet Earth, you know, we're only a little dot, a pinprick in the universe. We've got that energy density, but compared to sunlight that's hitting us, compared to chemical energy, compared to nuclear energy, it's a very not very dense. Whereas you go to the other extreme, a nuclear pinprick or a, 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 just a small head of a pin can probably you know power a house for a hundred years. Mm-hmm. So it's all about energy density, and that's where I found over the years. I thought, aha, that's where we're failing, because as soon as people start pointing to zero point energy, I start looking for well, what's the real energy source. They might actually be harvesting something else. And often we find that they're actually accidentally, they're using a coil, they're harvesting RF, they're harvesting some other form of ambient temp, uh, energy. So that's, that, that's the conundrum, if you like. That's the uh, irony of all this, that all this energy exists, but we haven't got the engineering means to harvest it. And I'll follow up on something you wrote to me about black light power and LNER. Now... Once again, the black light power demonstration come, and there is a phenomenon there. We all accept it. We see a little bit of energy in, massive energy out, but it's an event. The problem they've had for the last 12 years in Beryllion and everybody else who's researched with LNER, they haven't been able to engineer it into a continuous process that is commercially viable. I pray they will, or there'll be a breakthrough that they come. So some of these phenomena exist, these little exotic things in nature like, aha, if we do this and put hydrogen with that and treat it like this, bang, we got all this energy. But they haven't been able to engineer a way of harnessing that energy into a continuous process that is commercially viable. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I completely understand that, yeah. And and like even with HHO, I mean, uh, they're they're splitting the hydrogen and and water and they're yeah. they're creating energy from doing that, and it's viable and it's working. Um, there's all different ways of utilizing that process. Um, there's so much water on this earth. Why you know why are we going with nuclear? I'm, I agree I, with you. Oh, I agree. Use when you understand this. Energy, oh. Use wave energy. Wave energy. Well, yeah. Put it into hydrogen, then burn the hydrogen, and that. It's non-polluting, you know, it's great. I'm with you. The technology, and this is perhaps the point, uh, the technology exists, okay? And getting back to the original point I made about the third world, we have the technology, it's just finding out what that technology is being used for now and applying it to solve the problem. We have the technology. So the effort is... How do we apply with the knowledge and technology we've got now to build solutions and not wait around for the miracle free energy device? Because that might be 10 years away. It might be 100 years away. It might be 1,000 years away before they can find a way of cracking the way of harnessing an ambient energy source or a zero-point energy source. So I'm great for practical solutions now. But do not diminish the effort into researching into these exotic technologies. But the final point is truth is paramount. Scientific method, data and truth is the only foundation you can use to build upon because 
it won't get you anywhere talking about it. It won't get you anywhere wishing for it. You actually have to do something practical and apply it. And without applying it, then we get nowhere. So uh, I'm an optimist that uh, I'm more or less gone over the back to the fence of green technology, solar, and government policy is the way forward at this stage for the masses. If the miracle breakthrough comes, and here's the other good point, we're dismantling grid systems. In, in five years, you're going to see the grid coming apart in Australia and the, the other countries because of the, all the people putting solar on their roof and hot water systems and the wind energy farms and all that. The existing business model for the grid and the power brokers and the governments is, is that there's kickback already in the US. They want to tax people for using the sunlight. That's the latest thing. The power company is saying, if you've got solar, we want to tax you for using the sun. Wow. Oh, okay. That's cool. Yeah, that's pretty regressive. They've tried <laughs> something, you know, they've done something similar in Spain. They tried something like that in Australia and they just said, we're going to call it. The people said, uh, if you guys want to get re-elected, you better drop this right away. They tried to renege on some of the deals they did with the solar subsidies. People said, try that. You'll never get in power again. The government says, all right, we heard you. And when you got 20% of the people saying, you're out, they listen because okay, in America, yeah, I hear you. nobody has to vote, okay? I'm not going to argue the pros and cons of that. In Australia, because everybody votes, they have to listen to everybody. In Australia, America, they only have to listen to those people who bother to vote, okay, or who have bought the vote, you know, whereas in Australia, you have to listen. So 20% of the people in Australia say, you better not do that. We're going to be pissed with you. They listen because that's the difference of them being in power or not. In Germany, everybody who attacked the Green movement in the last election mm -hmm. got trashed and thrown out of government. The people spoke. Empower the people. The people to be empowered, the people must also do something for themselves, and that is participate. Don't talk about it. Go and do something. And when enough of you have done something, then you control the government, you control the corporations. Simple as that. Yeah, and I'm, um, while you're talking about this, I'm going online, and I and I can see that the Guardian uh, posted a, an article. Uh, I already took it off. That um, they want to tax uh, people who put solar panels, but uh, in Arizona, um, the proposal to tax solar energy uh, got a big no from Arizona Corporation Commission staff. So apparently, it was shot down in Scottsdale. Um, but they're trying in every other state. There's cases all over the states. This is the oh, they're sure. trying to. They're trying to snuff it out for it. They want the power companies to own the solar farms, okay? That means they control the energy to the people. They control the people. They don't want people to have their own solar panels because if you've got to own solar panels and the battery and storage technology comes through and they know it is the next three or four years, they're screwed. Now, New Zealand, a power company, and I love New Zealand, New Zealand, they're already doing not only the solar option for their customers, this is the power company, they're giving them the storage devices as well. They, they said, we want to be part of this. We're not going to exist in 10 years unless we change our ways. So some power companies now are being visionaries. They're actually changing the model. They're experimenting with new models of let's do microgrids, let's do community-based power again, let's do load sharing. Uh, it, it's really, really brilliant, and this is all starting to happen but more people have got to get motivated. And unfortunately, in some countries, and I don't want to be critical of Americans, but there's a lot of apathy there. There's a lot of enthusiasts. You know, 5% are very enthusiastic and loud, but 95% are so comfortable they don't care. They're just happy to pay their electricity bill each month as long as it keeps turned on. Well, that's, you want to you want to hear about. something crazy? Um, here in Pennsylvania, I'm in Pennsylvania, and um, we actually do have a solar a uh, solar farm. Uh, I'm sorry, a wind farm. And uh, across the top of the mountains, the Allegheny Mountains, we drive in certain sections. You will see miles and miles of wind turbines. And uh, I think the company is called Ambient. That provides the uh, alternative energy source from wind, but they charge uh, two cents more per kilowatt hour 
then the the main uh, Pico, whatever energy company um, that that has been providing it. So if it's if it's not costing them any money for the energy to push the turbines, it's just for them to build them. Why are they charging us more money? I mean, it's <laughs> I mean, two cents doesn't sound like a whole lot, but it, you know, over time, um, I'm not sure even what the average uh, the daily usage is of kilowatt hours. Like, uh, could you break that down? A solar panel. 12 solar panels provide, what, 200, uh, not 200, 40 kilowatts of, well, of power or something like well, that? Well, depend, depends on the size of the panels. You know, uh, a typical solar panel is 150 to 250 watts. But, uh, but you only get with solar, you've got to understand, you only get so many hours a day that you can get right. solar. Wind, wind quite often, it gets windy at night. That's why they often combine solar and wind operations together and what they're doing in minnesota and a few other states and canadian states they're hooking up hydro with wind and solar so they've got they've got the ability to spin up generators quickly when the sun's down or the wind drops uh and that's one of the battles why you need storage because without the storage it's really really hard to uh balance the grid but I just want to leave you with something. I've got to go in a few minutes. I don't know how long your program is. Yeah, that's fine. Absolutely. I've got, about, I've got about 15 more minutes. I'm looking at other countries and I'm going, wow, you know, we often talk about the US, but I'm sitting back. I'm in the Philippines at the moment living here and uh, it's a great launching spot to visit other countries. I'm two hours from Hong Kong, two hours from Thailand, two hours from Singapore, two hours from Japan. It's a great little central spot but i learned a lot of lessons here the philippines and this is a country you know that's got it, it's not it's a poor country okay but brilliant people and there's a lot of people here on a few islands they're gonna they're aiming for 100 percent 100 percent renewable energy for the electric grid within 10 years not 20 percent not five 100 percent and i think they'll achieve it Absolutely. That's thermal, solar, wind, uh, mainly wind and thermal, and and hydro, and they'll achieve it. I'm absolutely convinced they'll achieve it. They're already seventy percent of the way there, and I'm thinking, wow, if a little country like this can do it, why can't a mighty power like the US do it? Okay, and you look at New Zealand. I think they're seventy or ninety percent. I look at the Tasmania as in Australia is ninety-seven percent. Uh, renewable energies now so I'm looking at these models and thinking if these little countries can do it why can't the rest of the world do it and then people talk about electric vehicles and you know I read something like in New York they're going to test six taxis okay here in the Philippines they're building 150,000 electric vehicles they're going to replace the little motorbike trikes there's another American company's come over and they just started running some live they're replacing this smoky all burning jeepneys, uh, which is the main public transport, and most people here use public transport. Vehicle ownership is one in 50, you know, so mm -hmm. most people use public transport. They're running these electric vehicles now, and they're viable. They've got built a business model that they can run these, and, and guess what they're recharging it from? Renewable energy. So they're running an electric vehicle down the road, picking up passengers, dropping them off in a business model that has improved the life and income of the drivers not polluting the atmosphere and they're recharging it from renewable energies well so if a little country like this can do it why in the hell can't we change policy in other big western developed companies to do the same it is possible the technology is there it's all about not just the will of the, of the government or the, or the will of the people the governments will change if the people put enough pressure on them it's, it's not just sit there and point and blame the government. You've actually got to do something yourself to, to help bring about this revolution. Like I said, my niece in Australia, she's one of hundreds of thousands of people who said, we're going to do something. But did she do it for green reasons? Absolutely not. She did it for economic reasons. It was cheaper because of the subsidies that put to her to switch to this to save electricity. She no longer has to pay for electricity. 
if she puts a few more panels on, which she'll do, and buys an electric car in a couple of years' time, she'll be totally energy independent. She'll have free electric car and she'll have free household. That's what you call energy independence. So you don't need to wait for a free energy solution to solve all the problems. You can do something now. You've Absolutely. just got to you've just got to do something. And that's what I keep saying to people. Do something. Don't talk about it. Do something. Yeah, I, I had a gentleman, um, John Cluxton, and he, he he got fed up with paying his electric bill and he told him to come and cut the electric uh supply from his house to cut the line he didn't want it and he bought one panel and in two years he built up to 12 panels and he yep. now he gets all his energy from the solar and he's in texas by the way and yep. he um he of course doesn't doesn't live the extravagant life most people do he doesn't have a refrigerator he uses like a cooler an electrified cooler and uh he he they they can only run their computer at certain times of the day. He has one air conditioner in the bedroom. You need that in Texas. Night. <laughs> yeah, they live down in Texas. So I mean, they live a real frugal life. I I mean, it's completely different than what most Americans might be used. Even the people who have the the least ways and means to live, um, they they live a much frugaler life. But they they have opportunity to do other things and they don't have to pay an electric bill. So, yeah, it's yeah, absolutely... Yeah, you're correct. Uh, one, one thing that surprised me here in the Philippines where I'm used to talking to guys about free energy and all that and, you know, a few very interesting ladies. Here in the Philippines, you go, you go to a party, the women are talking about, oh, I just bought an electric motorcycle or, or all the energy-saving ways it get because every cent counts to them. It's another cent they can put towards their children's education. The women are so switched on about energy and the men aren't. <laughs> I'm going, what? <laughs> so the women are all communicate like electric motorcycles in Asia are booming and this is that. And they, I walk in the room and I say, ah, there's Mark. Tell us about solar panel. What can we do here? What about biodigesting? Uh, what can we do about this? And I'm going, wow, these, these people are switched on. And I'm totally amazed that, you know, quite often uh, it's about education. It's about getting knowledge to people. Absolutely. You know? and, and, and the other thing that happens too, like uh, I saw, I've seen this in communities in Australia, an urban street, one or two people get solar PV or this, and the other neighbours get curious and they all talk about it and they have a dinner party or a grill, you know, interact with the school, like why are they at the school, you know, oh, what's it, solar panel? Suddenly the whole street's got them, <laughs> the whole community. Or well, the whole community, I've seen this happen too, where I say they'll get together and say, what if we go and put some pressure on these people and do a bog buy? And they all go in and said, well, rather than just fit out one house, we've got 10 to do in the same street. Okay, and they get a huge discount. Just silly things like that. Absolutely, but, yeah. And, and what you're doing and this, I guess, my message I want to give to you, what you're doing is the most important thing of all, disseminating the information to people. I've got my opinion. There's other people with different opinions. All opinions are equally valuable. But getting the information, I gave your people some clues today. Go to revolutiongreen.com and have a look. I haven't read any articles for a couple of weeks because I'm on holidays with my daughters. But... Have a look at the articles there. See what communities are doing in the US, how they're getting together. You've got to take that first step. It's a bit like a drug addict or a drunk, you know. First thing you've got to do is take that first step to bring about the change, okay? And when you can do that, things move and move fast. And I'm sitting here in this little island community of 7,000 islands and 96 million people and going, Wow! They're going to be 100% renewable in 10 years. They may not quite get there, but at least they're trying. You know, it might take them 20 years. And suddenly I'm looking at other things they're doing here. I'm going, wow, they're actually building all these electric vehicles. They're starting to implement them. They're riding around on electric scooters. They're doing this and that. And it all just takes action, action by the people. So don't blame change. That's my motto for 2014. Don't blame change change so i'm Absolutely. open to any questions any questions you've got i've got a few minutes left so well uh, the I, question I, would be you 
Uh, you're welcome to promote uh, your website is revolutiongreen.com and I've posted it on the chat. Um, so is re revolution dash green because dash there's green. another revolution green, yeah. And okay. well, it's not my website, but I tend to write a lot of articles there, and I'm trying to do what you're doing. I, I don't get paid for it; uh, it actually costs me money. But I'm just trying to get those stories across. You know, how to bring about change. Hopefully, some people pick up some information there because the information dissemination. If people don't know, they can't do anything. If they know about it, then at least they've got the information they can make the decision for themselves. Absolutely, and that's that's the whole point of it. And don't take our word for it. Go yeah. and research these things yourself and, and educate yourself and talk to your family and your community and share your knowledge because that's how we, that's how we change. That's how we... Um, can become empowered and 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 live a life free of the tentacles of of the corporations that are strangleholding us in all in all all systems uh, social political financial energy health well spiritual. it's unfortunate in america that i think we the people has now become that's what's happened. You've lost control of your government. You've lost control of many aspects of society. But America still is one of the greatest countries in the world. It's got wonderful people. It's got wonderful resources. And uh, I just ho hope you can find a way forward by people taking action and by influencing government and government policy. Look at, look at all the mistakes other countries have made. Look at the good examples and I can tell you in Germany and Australia and New Zealand and the Philippines, they've made a whole lot of bad decisions, but they've learned from it. Look at the models that are working. Look at the models that are failing. And then adopt. Look outside. And if you do that, you might get the knowledge you need. And do the research, like I said. Don't take my word for it. Go out there and have a look for yourself. Absolutely. Okay, well, thank you, Mark. Uh, this has been very interesting, and I've thought of a hundred more questions of <laughs> that I could ask myself. you. I can even email you. <laughs> I've actually got a taxi waiting outside. My oh, well, then go. <laughs> go, go, go. <laughs> we're, off to, we're off for a couple of days of R&R &R at a big lake and a volcano, and uh, I'm the one holding them up, so I do have to go. Otherwise, I'll be in trouble for the next well, two days. Well, thank you so, so much. Thank you for yes. your time. Thank you. Thanks we'll talk to you soon. Thank and, you. Uh, and uh, to all your listeners, uh, go out there and do something. Have fun. Enjoy yourselves. And uh, I think the best story you told, you don't have to do something major. Start small. Get familiar with it. One solar panel and you right. sort of get, it becomes an obsession then. And you go, I'm going to have two solar panels and three solar panels. And eventually, you know, just learn about it. Take small, gentle steps first. Don't dive in. Take small, gentle steps. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks a lot, Chrissy. <laughs> thank you. Have a safe have trip. Ride. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. And, well, that was Mark Dancy. Uh, he's in the Philippines, and he is one of the contributors to revolution-green.com. You want to check out the website. Um, lots of really interesting information there about energy. Most important, do the research yourself. Don't uh, take our word for it. And you'll uh, have a lot of opportunity to find out about a lot of different information. All this is possible. Uh, we have uh, hosts here that are actually uh, promoting uh, different uh, projects, uh, their own creations and, and others. And, and we actually have uh, cultists and shiziz or promoting the, the, the pop-pop boat experiment, uh, which I will put a link up for that. And uh, Muddy, Muddy Mud Man uh, is uh, promoting, and I don't, know, I don't know if it's been auctioned off or whatever, a, um, a wind turbine um, that you have to put together. So that would be a really good way to learn about this technology. So um, and you can buy kits. They're all over eBay, wherever. And um, as I find those uh, 
links. I will post them on the chat box. And of course, uh, this information will be provided in the archive with the audio. So thank you all for listening. Uh, we're going to go for a short break, and I will be back. Uh, you're listening. Freedom. Law. Education. Health. Free energy. Money. Debt. Awake Radio, deconstructing the dream world, one lie at a time. You didn't think it was going to be that easy.